Okay, well, it's 1017. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> We're so excited to hear about these great um, community based projects. And I just uh, sit, put a note in the chat that if you have or know of a, a neat project in your area and want to drop it in the chat to share a little bit about it, that would be great. Um, Otherwise, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to have Alfonso is going to go first and tell us about his project. And then um, you can uh, save your questions for him till the end of his presentation or, again, put them in the chat. So with that, we'll just go ahead and let him get started. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Joanna. Um, so uh, my name is Alfonso Leva. I'm park planner with the uh, City of Manhattan Parks and Recreation. Um, I'm uh, originally uh, born and raised in Southwest Kansas, uh, around Liberal, uh, Kansas. Uh, grew up out in the country around Seward, uh, in, in Seward County. Uh, have a little bit of an agri uh, agricultural background. Um, I graduated uh, from Kansas State uh, in 2016 with a uh, Master of Landscape Architecture degree. Uh, right after college, I went out to Denver, uh, Colorado uh, for about a year and a half with a uh, private landscape architecture uh, firm. Um, you know, I, it, it was great. I enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, the, the mountains, uh, reconnecting with the extended family that I hadn't seen in, in years. Um, but I, I knew I belonged in Kansas um, and, and fell in love with, with the Manhattan area, um, saw that this position was open, uh, park planning with the city of Manhattan Parks and Recreation, applied for it and I got it. So I've been, I've been back in Manhattan since 2017, about uh, December 2017. Um, and uh, I definitely enjoy working with, uh, um, with a lot of uh, planning, design and management of capital improvement projects for the parks, uh, recreation, uh, and zoo divisions with the city. Um, you know, I, I, I'm also responsible for the community engagement, uh, preparation of conceptual plans, construction documents, master plans, reports and cost estimates. And then I work um, uh, with, with other uh, departments within the city and, and um, other organizations in the community as well. Um, but uh, so um, it, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, uh, that the Kansas Rural Center reached out to me and and wanted and was interested in learning more about our pollinator pockets. Uh, this is something that um, uh, you know it, it's a it's a passion of mine. Uh, when I did my master's report uh, at K State, um, it had to do with. Uh, with designing with nature, and really that that, that takes place. Um, it's based from from uh, from a book uh, that I, I read in college uh, by Ian McCarg, and that's Design with Nature. Um, Ian was uh, one of the most influential environmental planners and landscape architects of the 20th century. Um, and with design with design with nature, uh, McCarg meant that the way we occupy and modify the earth is best when it's planned and designed with careful regard to both the ecology and the character of the landscape. Um, you know, in this way, he argued that our cities, industries, farms could avoid major natural hazards and become truly regenerative. Uh, and more deep, deeply, McCarg believed that by living uh, with rather than against the more powerful forces and flows of landscapes, uh, communities would gain a stronger sense of place and identity. And so uh, that kind of led my, um, uh, my master's uh, thesis of uh, uh, titled Implementing Ecologically Inspired Landscape Design Retrofits Within Ex-Urban Neighborhoods. So I got to engage with one of the neighborhoods uh, during that time with uh, um, here in Manhattan and, and got to gauge uh, uh, some community input at the time. And I've kind of taken that um, um, uh, and, and transitioned it to, to now uh, with, with this project. Um, so let me get started here. Kind of go through the agenda real quick. Uh, so we're going to go through the. I want to go through the pollinator pro uh, pockets goals. Uh, kind of the background, a uh, little survey that we took in the community, and how we um, um, compared that with the national survey that was taken. Um, and then uh, go through quickly some of the uh, pollinator pockets conceptual locations uh, uh, here within Manhattan. Some signage that we'll that we'll implement, and then we could uh, get into uh, questions and discussion. There we go. 
So the goals of pollinator park, it's really is to increase the pollinator species within our parks, uh, decrease the invasive species, increase ecological awareness uh, through social media uh, and, and other forms, and then uh, proactive learning through community engagement. Um, Teresa Mueller, uh, she's our marketing and community relations officer. She's been, uh, she and I have been uh, uh, working a lot on, on that aspect of, of increasing the ecological awareness through social media, but also uh, the proactive learning through our community engagement. Um, she's the one that helped me design the, uh, the Pollinator Pockets logos. Um, uh, this is for, uh, you know, the project as a whole and then the ambassadors, which, which is something that we, we want to use for the, uh, um, for, for uh, some, kid, uh, some activities for children in the community as well. Um, and um, it's, uh, she's a great asset uh, within the Parks and Rec. It's been great uh, working with her over the past year on this. Unfortunately, she is moving to, to Alaska in about a month, but uh, hopefully I could uh, continue to move forward with what she's done um, in social media and, and kind of getting this uh, out uh, for, um, uh, for this project. Um, and, you know, proactive learning through the community engagement, you know, that also is, um, throughout this process, we've been trying to uh, acquire partnerships uh, in the community. Uh, so within Parks and Recreation, the Sunset Zoo and the Flint Hills Discovery Center are also part of, uh, uh, of Parks and Rec. And so it's, it, I've been making, uh, uh, you know, relationships, enhancing relationships there uh, with some of the contacts that, that do a lot of the same work um, that, that we want to do with this project. Uh, I've also uh, contacted folks at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism, uh, the, the Kansas Native Plant Society, uh, the Kanza uh, Prairie Biological Station, the Audubon of Kansas, uh, and recently um, a, a local organization has, uh, uh, has wanted to get involved, and that's the, uh, the Flint Hills Association of Realtors. So definitely a lot of support here in the community and want to uh, uh, expand on that as well. So a little bit of background. Um, this, oh, so it would have been just before COVID uh, hit, uh, the park superintendent, Casey Smithson, and I uh, were, were looking at um, uh, creating a, a new turf management, uh, turf maintenance plan for the for the parks. Uh, we were also thinking of projects for a, for a, um, a, a park planner intern who was getting into um, that we were going to get that that spring semester. Uh, you know, thinking up of some of, of some projects that we wanted to move forward with. Uh, this was something that was on a back burner. Um, Casey and I wanted to to move this forward, but we just didn't have uh, the time. So this was a great project to to have an intern work on to get started. Uh, unfortunately, you know, once COVID hit, um, we all got sent home. Uh, we worked from home. Uh, my uh, intern at the time, she worked from home, home a little bit as well, uh, but then ultimately we had to let her go there towards the, uh, the end of March, beginning of April. Um, so I kind of picked up from there, uh, starting in the summer, um, and, and did an, uh, you know, analyzed our parks. We have about 30 parks within Manhattan, uh, looked at, uh, you know, over 600 acres of, of parkland um, uh, that we, we, we maintain. And so there's definitely areas that we thought that we could uh, uh, minimize the mowing, put it on some sort of uh, uh, a scheduled uh, mowing, but then and then also implement uh, native plants to to um, uh, to really benefit the the pollinators as well. And I mentioned the or organizations that 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 have uh, have joined us and and are assisting us in this. Um, and you know, moving forward, uh, we want to implement the first phase, which is at uh, Girl Scout Park, and I'll touch that. Uh, I'll touch on that uh, here in a little bit as well. So the survey that we sent out when this first began um, was uh, it was simple two questions, and really I got this from from uh, uh, from a, a national survey that I saw within the uh, the Kansas. Uh, the, the, the NRPA, the National Recreation and Parks Association, they sent out this survey kind of gauging to see, you know, uh, taking a pulse of, of, of how receptive people are of implementing um, uh, plants that support pollinators. Uh, and there was a, a, a lot of support, uh, you know, 95% of Americans, and this is out of about a thousand, I think, yeah, about a thousand and two adults 
18 and over who were surveyed. And then and the second question was, you know, how comfortable do you feel implementing these items? And uh, as, as you could see there, uh, only 34% of Americans were completely or very confident in knowing what to do or, or how to implement uh, their own uh, um, butterfly gardens and such. So we used a lot of the, we used the same questions because I wanted to compare, all right, how, how do Manhattan residents feel about these, uh, these uh, items as well? And we actually, we, we were, um, we exceeded uh, what was found nationally. I had about um, 400, between 400 and 500 uh, respondents of the survey. Uh, so we had almost 98% of, of, of those surveyed uh, thought that the, that the city should make um, uh, special efforts to create designated areas for plants uh, to support the health and growth of pollinators. And then a little over 50% were confident in knowing what to do uh, to get that implemented. So it was, it was great seeing that information, uh, seeing that data, um, knowing that the community was receptive. And so we wanted to push forward with, with this pollinator pockets. Um, so this map shows you uh, Manhattan with a little bit of the uh, 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 rural component as well. And the, the yellow stars are existing pollinator pockets on public property. And so uh, there's, you know, there's some within the area um, uh, when, when I uh, analyzed our parks and looked at where we could implement uh, these, these, uh, these pollinator pockets, um, I, uh, you know, I looked at our 30 parks um, and uh, looked at uh, potentially implementing in this first phase about 18 acres within our parks um, to, to plant um, uh, native vegetation. Uh, to, to support our local pollinators. Um, and so the, this, uh, the peach colored uh, um, details where we would implement um, uh, this first phase. So we start to fill in some of those gaps that we see within the community. Um, I, I, I know personally, I've seen um, other people, you know, they have their own personal um, butterfly gardens or, or native vegetation. Um, and so this is just looking at the public side of things, but I know there's a lot more um, uh, that people are, are, are uh, implementing their own uh, butterfly gardens within, within the city. Um, uh, and so I don't know how familiar anyone is with Annenberg Park, but uh, it's one of our parks that, uh, that has a lot of the mowed grass. A, a lot of our sports field are, are contained there. Uh, however, there is, a, there is a good chunk of it, though, that uh, is, is within a, a flood-prone pro, flood area. So we're able to, uh, to, to, to designate that and go in a later date and put in uh, uh, more native vegetation. Uh, right now, I believe it's only mowed once, uh, once a year. Um, you know, once we get that, uh, uh, some more uh, diversity in there, perhaps we could um, uh, start to uh, um, uh, mow that every other year. Um, uh, we are hoping at one point or another to start burning within the city. Right now it's not allowed. Um, however, uh, we're, we've been working with the, uh, uh, with the fire department uh, to start burning at one of our other parks, Roger Schultz Community Park. It's uh, it's, uh, it's a park that we've gone into partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, to, to clear out a, a lot of the invasives out there and, and restore uh, about 60 acres of prairie. And really the most beneficial way to do that is to burn. Um, so uh, I feel like we're getting there, uh, that people are getting a little bit more comfortable with that. But uh, we'll have to see, hopefully within the next couple of years, we can start implementing that uh, that fire plant within our other areas within our parks as well. Um, and, you know, these are just a, a, some of the other, some of the smaller areas where we're looking at uh, this property here uh, is the Bethany Drive. It, it was a project, it was a, uh, it was a, um, a site that, that the city had to buy because it flooded regularly when Wildcat Creek floods. Um, and so uh, we, we bought out that, uh, that resident and, and it's something that uh, the parks, we maintain it. So we'll go in there and, and mow the grass, but it's definitely an area that, that, that we could uh, revert back to its natural state and maintain it as such. Uh, same goes along with this Fairmont property, uh, same, uh, same uh, uh, circumstances there. 
uh, and then we start to get into our other parks, you know, where, where there's some trees, uh, where there's some space that, you know, necessarily there, there isn't a whole lot of open space. We could start to, to put, to infill some of this, uh, uh, these pollinator pockets. Uh, this is ledge stone. Um, it's actually quite a bit of, uh, of uh, rolling hills here. Um, initially, we would start with something small, but this is one of those parks where we'll be able to implement this uh, quite extens extensively in the future uh, once we start uh, programming it into our, uh, into our rotation. Uh, Northeast Community Park, it, it's already, uh, it already has a, a chunk of it that's uh, maintained and and burned uh, with the, uh, uh, the Northern Flint Hills Audubon Society. Uh, that's one of the organizations that I've made contacts with as well, um, uh, moving this forward. Uh, you know, for the most part, Northeast Community Park is, is just all mowed uh, uh, grass. Uh, there's some sports fields out there, but um, it, it isn't programmed very often. Um, this park, uh, we are uh, hopefully within the next couple of years will be um, working on updating the master plan for this park. Um, so we'll be able to engage the community and, uh, and see how receptive they are of this idea um, and uh, how much of this we could restore back to, to a native prairie. Uh, throughout this process, we knew that two of the locations were going to get a little bit of pushback, and that was because it was they were surrounded by um, by houses, and that was uh, Pioneer Park. Oh, I'll have to go to it later, but it was Pioneer Park and Girl Scout Park. Um, Pioneer Park is right next to the Riley County Historical Society. Um, it is a uh, it's. It's really just a sloped piece of land. Uh, a, a lot of times when we engage the Riley County Historical Society, they don't wanna do a whole lot with this um, because, uh, uh, because of its historical value. So then I reached out to, uh, um, uh, to Cheryl Collins and, and asked her, all right, so what can we do? You know, and she was in favor of something like this, going in with, with uh, native prairie, native vegetation, um, uh, um, vegetation to help uh, uh, our local pollinators. Um, but then we started to hear a little bit of pushback from some of the neighbors around here. You know, I, initially we were planning on, on, on uh, implementing the pollinator pockets within the whole park. Uh, but as we heard more from from some of the local neighbors, you know, they do use this open space. Uh, you know, they go out there with their dogs or their family and and use it. So uh, we we gave a little bit back that we we're gonna we we're gonna mow on a on a more frequent frequent uh, uh, timeline. Um, but for the most part, we're we're still gonna hopefully uh, get most of that property to go back to its uh, its native prairie and implement these uh, this vegetation. Um, but, but we knew that going in. I mean, it was something that, that I knew we were gonna get some sort of uh, a pushback. Uh, this presentation, uh, I presented it to our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board as well. Um, they had received some comments, but for the most part, it was all favorable. Uh, a lot of people wanted to see this, uh, th this initiative get implemented. Um, this is up at Stag Hill. It's, uh, it's somewhere where there is a little bit of uh, erosion from stormwater. Again, we could use rain gardens, we could use uh, vegetation in these instances and, and, uh, and increase our overall um, area where we can implement these, uh, uh, this native vegetation. Uh, to support our local pollinators, Warner Park. It currently it currently has uh, quite a bit of open space. Um, uh, I recently completed the master master plan for this uh, park, uh, probably about a year or two ago, and um, we got a lot of good feedback from the from the neighbors. As you can see, it's surrounded completely by uh, by residential. Uh, um, property. Um, so there was quite a bit of input. Uh, it, it, and at, at one point, it was quite contentious because a lot of the, uh, so a local organization, um, uh, the disc golf groups, they wanted to uh, expand the nine hole disc golf that they have over here uh, on the on the east side. They wanted to expand it and spend expand that into 18 holes throughout the park. But there was a lot of opposition from the uh, from the local residents, and ultimately we kept it at nine. Um, but we are going to enhance the trails, and we did talk about increasing um, spaces where we would uh, uh, wouldn't mow as often. Um, uh, again, to to increase that uh, biodiversity uh, that, and uh, and such. 
Um, so this is Girl Scout Park. I mentioned this earlier when I said, you know, I, that we knew we were going to get some opposition uh, uh, from some of the neighbors. And it was actually, this is where we're going to start our first phase. The first part of our first phase is going to be here at Girl Scout Park. Um, the HOA in this area actually reached out to me and wanted me to present to them what we were doing with this initiative. And they were fairly receptive. Um, uh, in previous engagements with them, they, they, they haven't been receptive. Uh, we, we recently put in some trails over here to, along this area, and they pushed back a little bit on that. However, they, they really, really liked this initiative and were supportive of it. Um, uh, we didn't get a whole lot of opposition in this area. Uh, we did get some feedback that um, some of the fraternities and sororities along this area do use this open space, either a pickup football game or, or such. And so with that feedback, you know, we decided to then bring back, uh, open up that space so that the, the community could then uh, use it as, as they have before. Um, but we still want to, uh, you know, start to implement the pollinator pockets within the park as well. So definitely working with those with those who use the park uh, listening to uh, to make sure we're we're getting everybody's uh, um, uh, input that uses the park and then uh, also um, be supportive of these types of initiatives so um, uh, part of this is also like I said the, is the ecological awareness um, and so uh, part of that is implementing these signs you know this these are going to be 36 by 48 signs that we're going to have within these areas that kind of tell you know tell the story you know what are pollinators what what does poll how does pollination work so on and so forth um, and uh, I, I want to redesign this a little bit to include our partners uh, somewhere we could put stickers and such as we build those those um, connections those those partnerships you know I, I want to um, start uh, uh, getting them recognized uh, in these signs as well um, you know uh, the Girl Scout Park was the first park where um, the Flint Hills, uh, uh, the, the Realtors Association, uh, they reached out to me and wanted to get involved. And, that, you know, a handful of their members um, came and, and helped us pull weeds. I mean, uh, it, it was just as easy as that. Um, uh, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife they they assisted us by um, uh, by analyzing Girl Scout Park and Pioneer Park and seeing what we have there. Um, over the past year, we did we did let those areas grow out um, and to to kind of get an idea of what we have there already. And it turned out that Girl Scout Park was was uh, it didn't need a whole lot of um, uh, of, of changes for it to start um, uh, being a benefit to our local pollinators. Uh, so we're, we're, we're definitely going for that low, lowest hanging fruit. Uh, Pioneer Park is gonna take a lot more work. Uh, there are some invasive species there that, that'll need to get handled, um, but uh, uh, we're moving forward with Girl Scout Park. And uh, it seems this, uh, the Flint Hills Association of Realtors are really taking ownership. And that's really what we wanna see. Uh, people to feel a little bit of sense of pride in, in parks that they're helping, uh, uh, you know, change from from uh, open spaces that are just mowed, uh, you know, every two to three weeks to, to, to um, implementing these pollinator pockets and benefit uh, our local uh, pollinators. So um, that's uh, kind of what we're doing here in Manhattan, Kansas in our park system. Uh, definitely. Uh, Again, grateful that I was uh, had this opportunity to share this with you. Um, I've uh, recently been uh, uh, I've recently been uh, uh, contacted by uh, um, uh, another member that I've worked with in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Lauren Mendenhall. She's the president of the uh, Kansas Wildlife Federation. Um, she's asked me if I'd be interested in uh, in joining their board of directors. And uh, so I accepted. So I'll be part of that organization moving forward. So this 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 project has really given me some uh, uh, some contacts that I can make and to to kind of get this uh, make those connections and 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 push and and help this initiative here in Manhattan and then hopefully regionally as well. Um, so, but again, thanks for thanks for the opportunity and be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. What a Fabulous project and really interesting um, presentation. That, and it was so, you know, interesting to hear about like the, the pushback and navigating. Those are things I wouldn't have even you know thought of. So really fantastic. 
Um, let's see, do we have, it looks like um, we do have a question and comment um, from Mike Houts. He says, it's very interesting project. I'm at KU and working on a project with the university and city to try to do the same thing. So far we have identified about 100 acres at 13 sites and now trying to find funding to do the restoration enhancement. Is your city funding your project or what and or what proportion is grant funded? Oh, uh, right now it's it's all operational dollars. Um, we we haven't started uh, looking at where where those grant opportunities are. Um, uh, so I'm definitely starting to look for for those as well. Uh, uh, ultimately, the what we want to do with this is is have a document, uh, you know, some sort of maintenance and and uh, implementation uh, document that w that we have on hand uh, that we could uh, uh, use uh, moving forward. Um, but you know, dedicated money, we don't have it just yet. Um, it's definitely something. If 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 we do get that, uh, we'll definitely be rolling out a lot more more acreage. Uh, but for now, we're going to be working with operating dollars, um, and uh, and we'll see where it goes. Um, definitely, uh, definitely looking for more grant opportunities as well. Uh -huh. yeah. We got a comment that says that at the Fort Worth uh, Botanical Gardens. Um, they used a program called Pollinator Pizza for the kids. It helped them understand what toppings, et cetera, were dependent on pollinators. So mm. that's a neat thing. Uh, we have a question from Carol. Will the design of each pocket be the same, the same mix of plants, and will there be water features such as puddlers, et cetera? For the most part, it'll be the same designs. Um, however, uh, like in one of those, uh, one of those that I had shown at Stag Hill, there is a um, there is a a water component to it, um, so uh, it's it, it'll be a little bit different vegetation, um, but uh, for the most part it'll be it'll be a lot of the same uh, vegetation throughout, um, uh, and uh, uh, working with uh, some of our local organizations and and K State to to understand. Um, you know, what, what would work in our area, what does work, uh, where we could implement it. Um, and uh, uh, Joanna, I'm glad you brought up, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the um, uh, engagement that we've done on social media uh, that Teresa's has helped with, you know, during, during pollinator week, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we pushed a lot of our, a lot of these areas that we're going to look at to, to implement this. And so we, we included uh, a lot of uh, uh, pollinator items uh, during Thanksgiving. We also did something similar where we, uh, you know, well, the pollinator equation, you know, what, what, what pollination takes to make your Thanksgiving, your Thanksgiving as well as, mm -hmm. uh, as your Christmas. So this was part of our, our engagement and, and, uh, and also uh, informing uh, our, our local residents as well. Oh, very nice. That's great. Okay, we've got one more question. Um, is soil improvement part of the plan to help sustain the plants? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll have to go in and and uh, and test uh, uh, what we have there and uh, see what we could do to to enhance it a little bit. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of these parks or a lot of this property at once was was grazed quite a bit, but uh, or farmed. But uh, that'll definitely be part of the analysis. Oh, great. And then we have a comment from BJ um, says, wonderful presentation. I'm from Johnson County, Kansas and, and, and EMG and EMN. I would love to chat more and maybe borrow some of your ideas. So um, maybe do you, um, I don't know, could you drop your email in the chat perhaps? Yeah, and yeah definitely. Uh, definitely yeah. Uh, open to, to talking with people and, and making those connections uh, a lot. It's, it's been awesome that a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, uh, people who have their own uh, um, uh, butterfly gardens and such, they reach out to me and they, they willing to donate uh, seed as well. You know, yeah, I get yeah. making some connections um, is, is always great. Uh, but uh, I'm open Good. to, to, to um, Oh, I think I just sent that to you, Joanna. Let me send that to the group. <laughs> All right, and there's one more question and then we will move on um, to our next presentation. Uh, Margie Stewart says, this is terrific. Is there a way to tie local in local gardens, perhaps through the website where residents could post what they're seeing? You've kind of just mentioned that people are sending 
things and oh yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. that's something yeah. that that I think we could we can engage uh, uh, our our community in that as well. Uh, we have a new program called uh, Bang the Table, which is going to be a way that people could could start to engage with this better. And I think that's a great opportunity to explore that. Well, thank you so very very much. Uh, we sure um, appreciate it and learned. I learned so much, and I'm sure everybody else did too. And we really appreciate your time. Can't wait to see how the project progresses. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll turn it over now uh, to Dr. Marion uh, Pearson, and I'm gonna pull up. Uh, let's see, we'll pull. Oh, I forgot to do to share my screen. Um, all right, let's see here. Okay, all right. Okay, Dr. Pearson, do you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your project? Sure, can you hear me okay, Joanna? Yes. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to join you today. I did not know the group. I am so happy to um, meet all these participants and to be here this morning. Um, we're getting ready for a big Sunday game. So everybody root on the Chiefs, go Chiefs. My name is Dr. Marion Pearson and I'm a local pediatrician here in the greater Kansas City area. I am originally a Kansas City native, a Kansas City urban native, grew up right near the 18th and Vine Jazz District here near downtown Kansas City, Missouri. I have no, agri no real agricultural background. I've never even had a garden. I've uh, never kept bees, but about 13 months ago, um, we set out to start a nonprofit organization to reclaim vacant and blighted lots and to convert them into honeybee farms. Um, so I'm gonna break my presentation and it's gonna be a brief one, but I'll break it up into three main sections. Who are we? Why are we doing this and what's next? <clears throat> so who we are is again, I am a pediatrician by training I'm not an agriculture specialist and not even a beekeeper, really. But what I am is a honey file. I love honey. And I love the medical and medicinal sort of benefits that honey provides. And a couple of years ago, my husband said, you love honey and you've thought about keeping bees. Well, I bet you've never heard of this team. And he showed me an article about a group in Detroit, Detroit Hives, Inc. And it was a young couple. Um, African-American couple, Tim Jackson and Nicole Lindsay. And Tim and Nicole are Detroit natives and they watched their city declare bankruptcy and then become overrun with, I think 70,000, some ridiculous number of vacant and unkept lots. City lots that the city couldn't take care of when residents moved out of the urban core in Detroit. And they said, these are wild lots with lots of wild things happening on them in a lot of ways, some good things happening on them if you look at the glass half full. And they said, what we could do was we could clean up these lots that are kind of dirty and collect debris and we could you know, turn them into apiaries. And they did a news story about them and that's the article that my husband presented. And I was like, that is crazy good. And I think that should come to Kansas City. And I will say my husband heads a large nonprofit um, called the Community Builders of Kansas City, and they help develop communities. And I said, you guys are always talking about blighted property and how it affects home prices and how it affects the quality of life for residents. What if we took some vacant properties here in Kansas City and made them more beautiful? And so I got some friends together, and this is honestly how I did it. I found some friends. I took started taking beekeeping classes. Um, I had some contacts that had been beekeepers and I said, hey, would you be interested in helping me do this? And all my friends said yes. So we got some funds together. We brought the team from Detroit Hives to Kansas City and we said, is Kansas City a great place to start something like what you did in Detroit? And they said, absolutely. And then we took off from there. Again, we got our nonprofit status at the end of 2019. In 2018, uh, 20, obviously, um, very quickly into 2020, we were hit with a global pandemic and we had started to think about our launch. Um, 
in March or April. And we kind of came up with the mission and we said, we're still gonna do it. So our mission formally is to bring about greater awareness of the role urban residents play in the creation, preservation, and really expansion of pollinator habitats in the Kansas City metro area. So formally, again, our mission is through education, community outreach, engagement, and support. That's how we try to achieve our mission. We honestly try to expose the urban community to STEM-related entrepreneurism and to a deeper level of knowledge around apiary science. As a scientist, I love the apiary science push. Um, so what we do is again, convert vacant land into pollinator habitats and apiary spaces for honeybees. We um, hope that we're contributing to health and wellness of our community since obviously one in every three bites of foods is dependent on a pollinator. So that is who we are. Um, we have a why around why are we doing this? And I've given you some of the explanation as to why we're doing it because there's lots of blighted property in, in urban areas and it, it grows wild. Um, but what we discovered was if we could think about the work we're trying to do um, in five main categories, we call it our hive five. And our hive five um, is really, again, our why. We're doing it because the bees are threatened. So we heard earlier today about the rusty patch bumblebee, but also honeybee colonies are dying off and honeybees are critically important. And although they are not a native bee species to North America, they are still critically important in our food chain. So we're doing it to save the bees, right? Um, we're doing it because urban residents who live around vacant lots deserve to see beauty. No one deserves to walk outside their front door and have to see um, vacant land that is, is collecting garbage. That is just not psychologically healthy for humans. And we felt like, you know, we could do something there. If we made sites more beautiful with native wildflowers, with um, uh, removing uh, invasive species, that could help not only the species that we're targeting in the bees and pollinators, but it would help the humans too. So we're doing it because we feel like this is a way we can add beauty to urban areas where people really were not being intentional about adding beauty. We're doing it because we need a secure food chain. Um, there are lots of food insecurities that plague um, urban areas where large grocery stores will not locate in certain areas, where people don't have access to healthy foods, fresh foods, um, or food that was grown anywhere near where they live. So we felt like we could be a little bit impactful on helping to secure a, a, a food chain that everyone could be um, helped by and proud of. So we feel like we're impacting the food chain. We've done this through um, a, a grant that we received. We are entirely grant and donation funded. So we partnered with the Missouri Department of Agriculture and they actually grant funded us to help um, impact the food chain uh, a bit to, to, again, grow more food and to not only grow more food, but to teach people how important po a healthy pollinator population is for growing food. So even if we're not producing hundreds and thousands of pounds worth of food, we are teaching people who um, are growing food. In fact, part of our model is to position our tiny apiaries near already existing community gardens. Because first of all, you already have a population in the neighborhood that's ready to engage in outdoor activities that recognizes they need and want to grow their own food. And so it's an easy sell, honestly. We heard a little bit about pushback you get from neighbors. But if you already have neighborhoods that have community gardens, again, they're already convinced. Now we just add on the next layer. Oh, if you have healthy pollinators nearby, you will produce more food. And isn't that better than standing outside and producing less food? And people go, oh, for sure it is. So um, we position ourselves near community gardens and again, hope that the gardeners find uh, the usefulness and understand our message and then transfer our message to other people. Um, so we're doing it for food. The fourth part of our hive five is STEM. Obviously, agriculture science is a STEM related field. We want more um, urban residents, especially minority communities, to recognize that the agricultural sciences are for you. You do not have to live out on rural property. 
in order to be an agricultural scientist. You don't have to live out on real property to become an entomologic um, advisor or specialist or have that sort of career. So entomology is a science. We've even thought about um, incorporating drone crop monitoring training with the youth that we're working with. So we're teaching them that, okay, all those hours you spend gaming in your urban home, um, you could actually use some of your gaming skills to become a drone uh, pilot. And then you can do things like monitor ag crops, which is a, a hundred thousand plus job opportunity for you. Um, so we're being creative to attract young people, again, who might be urban residents, who don't feel like they are part of the agricultural community and saying, absolutely, you have skill sets and you obviously have some common ground. We all have to eat food uh, and breathe clean air and have fresh water. You have some ownership in this and this is how you can participate. So again, we're doing it because there's tons of STEM opportunities related to doing things like starting an, an urban apiary. And then we're doing it, and, and the fifth point is not a minor point. We're doing it because there's economic opportunity in getting involved in beekeeping. Um, so we're doing it because there's money, not just, oh, you can sell honey, but thinking beyond that. Pollinator services are a billion dollar industry in the US. So if you become a beekeeper who has a large scale sort of pollinator operation, um, you have an opportunity be to enter the pollinator world. But certainly there's other opportunities. Even in beekeeping hobbyist sort of circles, there's tons of safety equipment that is for sale across the world. There's um, just beekeeping equipment between the hive boxes and the hive tools and the hive smokers. There is an entire industry around beekeeping in that way. So again, we want to include a, a community of people who just have not felt like they were included in this part of the, the food chain conversation and say, yes, you are indeed included. Um, one of the, the things we've done to do that is to start what we call ambassador certification. And the Kansas City ambassadors is a term we made up um, in March when we had to have our groundbreaking virtually via Zoom because of the pandemic, we did a, a nationwide ambassador training program where we did a little PowerPoint of Beekeeping 101. And if you stayed on the PowerPoint, you listened to the Beekeeping 101 slides, then at the end of it, you were awarded a KC ambassador certification. And all it really is, is um, a term similar to ambassador, um, which just denotes an accredited person that acts as a representative or promoter of a specified activity. And in our case, loving the bees. So if people listen to the Beekeeping 101 presentation, they would get the ambassador certification. And we've got probably three dozen people from all over the country, honestly, who have gotten these certificates, including um, we did an entire scout troop. And I say scout troop, because as you know, the Boy Scouts have changed to scouts because there are now females in the scouts and we have two Eagle Scout candidates who wanted to get M KC MB store certification. So we've worked with the scout troop. We've worked with the homeless campus here in Kansas City, Missouri, who wanted their um, staff to have MB store training so that they could eventually have um, a hive near their community garden. So we've just um, started at the basic level again, trying to tell people you don't have to own tons of property. You don't have to be a gardener. Again, I am not one. You don't have to be a lifelong beekeeper, but you too can in your own backyard um, do some of this work. Our um, apiary is located in the middle of the city. If you've been to Kansas City, it's near the Country Club Plaza, just a few blocks off the Country Club Plaza. And it sits on a six lot sort of open area because for, for a decade, there were like six houses that had to be demolished, that had got, fallen into disrepair and were demolished. And so they were assumed by the neighborhood and the neighborhood couldn't take care of the lots. And so then they um, re deeded them over to the big, a bigger nonprofit where my husband works and they just had to mow the lots every two weeks. So they were mowing and mowing and mowing for 10 years. And really what, the impactful work at Detroit Hives and, and others have done is they found that these lots, if you let them grow wild, yes, they 
can become overrun with invasive species and we're working on that, but they can also become places where humans aren't spraying herbicides and humans aren't spraying um, pesticides and actually some wild beauty can take place. So anyway, that's where we positioned our apiary across the street from a large community garden as well. And we have three active hives there and we will have three more this summer. So um, we started there and we're going to continue to grow. There's a slide in the background. It tells you a little bit, of, a little bit more information about who we are and what we're doing. We even have an apiary at the Children's Mercy Hospital Community Garden, which is the big hospital here in town for kids. And they've had a community garden near the hospital for years. And they said, hey, would you be interested in bringing a hive over here? And we did. It was a fantastic hive. We lost it though, unfortunately, this winter. The bees absconded or left. And there's a, a lot of literature around why colonies would up and leave a, a, a home where they were producing an amazing amount of honey and they, the gardeners were happy. It was just a fantastic hive. And then for whatever reason, and again, another reason we we're in it for saving the bees is that they just um, left and we don't know if they died off or if they just relocated. But anyway, so we've got two sites currently. Um, again, our main site is near the Country Club Plaza in the middle of a neighborhood um, that we partnered with near a large community garden. So what's next for us? What's next is what I mentioned. We'll add more hives onto our six lot um, apiary site. We have a partnership with the National Wildlife Federation where we host on our site, a garden for wildlife. Um, and the National Wildlife Federation partners with lots of organizations. One of them being the Jackson County, Missouri chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, a group of African-American women who volunteer in the community. And they partnered together and said, we want to have a garden for wildlife. And I said, great, put it on the apiary site. <clears throat> and so they, excuse me, they contact, they have a contact where they work with um, kids third through eighth grade, where they teach them about STEM interest. And <clears throat> one of the STEM interests is supporting pollinator gardens. And so again, they are growing some vegetables and we're helping to do that and kind of, again, deliver this content virtually to share with them what does it look like to plant a garden that pollinators need to help you with and that you're, you're, you are helping pollinators with as you plant. And so the mutual benefit from what you garden and what pollinators need, and again, it's a demonstration garden. So what's next for us is to continue that partnership. We have um, grant funding from the Missouri Department of Conservation, where we are going to convert some of the clover grass area and some of the invasive species that are covering it, lots of bush honeysuckle there. And we're gonna uh, mitigate that and try to convert it over to wild uh, flower, a wildflower prairie. Um, we're working with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund to provide a seed that will specifically thrive without a lot of watering or care right there in the middle of the city. Um, so we've got a lot of partnerships we're excited about and we're just excited to be able to share what we're doing. We'll make lots of mistakes. I just told you we're brand new but we'll also have some successes that perhaps haven't been seen in the city before. So, um, again, that's the entirety of my presentation. I will absolutely answer whatever questions you might have. All right, thank you so much for that um, fabulous presentation and what an exciting project. Um, it's really, really, uh, really great. Um, let's see, Caitlin, do you want to um, take a look at the questions and see what we've got? And also, um, we'll let Caitlin see if there are any in the chat. And then also, if people then want to jump in after that, you can feel free to unmute and just ask questions yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we have right now are just comments that people are making. Um, it seems like there's a community of people interested in doing similar things. People sound really inspired. But... As far as I'm seeing, I don't have any questions here. All right, okay. Oh God, very nice comments. Um, I'm trying to think if I have um, any questions. Um, well, how do you get, um, do you, you, how do you go about getting the like kids and stuff involved in it? Do you have a, I know you said the ambassador, um, certification, but do you also have any type of like mentorship or anything like that? 
For sure, that's a great question. So currently, because the city kind of went on lockdown, um, we can't interface the school that we had planned on it. So what we're doing now is again, I told you we started this with friends and family. My partner and I, my co-founder Brian Reeves, um, he and his friends come out as a as a group, and we're all masked and socially distanced, but. He comes out as a group to help care for the bees. Every Sunday, we take um, a group of kids out and it's usually a couple parents and a couple of their kids. And um, sun every Sunday morning, we volunteer to take care of the apiary, to pull and cut weeds or take care of watering if we need to. And then just to feed the bees when they need feeding and just to um, manage the hives when they need management. Again, we're doing that as small groups and we've got volunteers from age seven to 77. And people, again, just come out um, in small groups to, to volunteer. But it's been a great uh, uh, mental health benefit because people were closed in in the middle of the city um, during the pandemic. And one way that we could be safe was to get outside and be distanced. And so have, having that ability to offer that to the community, hey, you can come outside, wear a mask, socially distance from us, and really feel like you're contributing to the health of the world. And that was powerful for me and for the people who, who have been able to participate. It was very powerful to not feel helpless and trapped, but to feel powerful and uh, engaged. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine, because yeah, we live on a farm um, and I, we had sort of an influx of people that came out to the farm for, you know, to get compost or this or that. But I, um, it started to feel like a really nice sort of refuge for people to be able to be around other people and be and still be safe. So I can I can completely relate to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am seeing a couple of questions come in and I skipped one earlier, sorry about that. This is from BJ and they're asking if you could share a more specific location of your apiaries because they would like to visit. Mm. So um, our apiary is at 5030 Wabash Avenue in Kansas, Missouri. And if you do visit, we would love you to visit, but if you do visit, what you'll find is we have an awesome partnership with Evergy Energy Company and their green team and the Western Missouri Carpenters Apprentice Program. And Evergy donated a ton of material and the Carpenters Apprentice Program has agreed to provide the labor and they're constructing an, a beautiful fence for us. And they're fencing it because in the city, there are laws around or ordinances around how tall you can let your weeds grow. And we wanna stop mowing. So we're going to let ours grow pretty long. So we have to fence it in so that we don't get into a lot of trouble. But we also want to be protective of the community. We don't want anybody to engage with our hives in a way that's unhealthy for them or unhealthy for the bees. But if you stop by, you'll see it, 5030 Wabash Avenue. Um, the, uh, the Children's Mercy Community Garden is at 22nd and Gillum. And you will see it right there on the corner of Hospital Hill on 22nd and Gillum. You'll see the garden. And right behind the garden, on, at the bottom of the hill, there is our hive. I will ask if there's any visitors to be respectful. There is a community of homeless residents that lives near that site. And uh, we that was one of our challenges. We um, tried to engage with the population that is, moves in that area um, to let them know what we were doing and to invite them to ask us as many questions as we wanted. And when we had our first honey harvest, we even shared it um, again with the community that that is experiencing homelessness that lives near that particular site near downtown Kansas City, Missouri. So please oh, that's, come. That's so fantastic. I was wondering what you did with the honey. So that's really special, wonderful. Great, and then a question from Tony here. Did you start the 501C to be able to get funding? So we started the 501C3, um, to, yes, as a funding source, but again, this I am a physician, an active physician, and this is not my life's work. I'm not doing this to make money. I'm doing it because it's an amazing thing to be able to have the privilege to work on. Great. And then Margaret Stewart asks, are you documenting these projects with photos? <laughs> Absolutely. And I probably have more photos than I need to have. In fact, the kids that come and volunteer say, Dr. Pearson, stop taking our picture. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it's, it's really fun. And so I'm so happy. So yes, we have tons of photos. We, we are on, we're on Facebook. Uh, we're going to create a, a photo documentation journal to share with the kids at the ACCPA school that has the National Federation Garden 
National Wildlife Federation Garden for Wildlife with the links incorporated. So we'll share that link with whoever wants to see that photo journal diary. Great. And then last question that I see, are you working with KC Community Gardens in Swope Park? We absolutely are. In fact, the Kansas City Community Garden and the Giving Grove, uh, they run the large community garden across the street from our apiary. And our National Wildlife Garden for Wildlife raised beds um, are supplied with plants from KCCG. We are a certified youth garden. So if you go on the Kansas City Community Garden website, you will see our little tiny garden at 5030 Wabash because we are a partner garden with them. And then they've been super helpful in advising us because again, we don't know what we're doing and we need all the help we can get. <laughs> That's so great. Okay, well, are there any more questions for either of our presenters or just general questions that anybody wants to ask? And again, you feel free to, I think you're able to mute your own uh, and microphone if you wanna pop in and ask. Oh, let's see. Um, we have one more question on the chat. Um, there are two of us here who are currently working to get certified with the Xerxes Society. Um, I'm, that might be a be better certified. I'm not sure. Would it be possible to network with, or would, uh, would like to uh, network with you if possible? What, whoever um, from you, Moss Nail, would you want to unmute and, and talk a little more about that? Oh, let's see, you're still muted. Um, Got it, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. My friend Linda McKay and I had gone through the process to get certified on Xerxes and then when we were gonna do our training, COVID came in. So we're kind of like in the process of trying to do some, but uh, we're here in Kansas City area. Oh, she's in Overland Park and I'm in uh, Pleasant Valley. Uh, but, and we've done some of the work with the Food Not Lawns uh, and with some of the inner city gardens and stuff. And we're both community, Kansas City community uh, gardens members. So we might want to get together with Marion. Because uh, <laughs> the more different groups like this that you can network together, the more you can get done. And I, yeah, I really enjoyed this presentation, even though I came in very late on it. <laughs> oh, good. good. And we d we have recorded it. And so I think that it will be available if you want to watch it again. Yeah, because really, really wonderful information from both. I mean, and, and I love um, that was a reason we wanted to do this session was to sort of, you know, highlight some incredible things that are happening and build momentum, um, try to, you know, um, create more projects like this around the, the states and in the region. Um, it's great for the people and the pollinators and everything. So. Also, I've written on here somewhere. I don't, this is all brand new to me, but somewhere there was a place you could put pictures on the form and uh, my food, not lawns gardens, like 50 feet from a concrete plant in the front yard of this I mean, there's dust and stuff everywhere, but I planted a, some natives along with the, the food crops. And there's some pictures there of the, you know, local pollinators, the bees and the butterflies on a golden, I had several different kinds of goldenrod and other native plants. But it amazes me still that with all the dust and the noise and the highway and all the industry around here, still, if you, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> Excellent, that's good. Um, Sorry, I'm seeing two new questions here. We have one, is there a national network you are connecting with? Is there a national network that I'm connecting with? Is, is that... I think that's fielded towards you, but either, either you or Alfonso can answer. Um, so certainly we're connected with the Bee and the Butterfly Habitat Fund. We're connected with the Kauffman Foundation who's helping to fund us. Um, we're connected with the National Wildlife Federation and their Garden for Wildlife program. Um, so those are our national connections. Um, and I told you about the one with Detroit Hives, um, Department of Conservation, Department of Ag, the Shoemaker Family Foundation, Evergy. 
So we, we're making as, and um, the native planting wildlife organization. So we want to do all kinds of connection, connecting, and we hope to do that through greater partnership to greater awareness, honestly, just like this one. Thank you. And then for Alfonso, have you considered adding apiaries to your pollinator pockets? Uh, no, I have not. Um, it's definitely something that uh, that I could uh, start to look around for uh, to see if we have any any local beekeepers. I know there's a there's a handful out there <clears throat> around Manhattan, um, but it'd be interesting what kind of uh, partnership we could create there, and and you know of course work with the with the city process on 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 the implications there. But uh, thanks, thank you for the idea. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say on that, Alfonso, I think there's the Save Farm. Um, it's a retired um, Colonel uh, Lagrange. That he had a big beekeeping, a veterans beekeeping training operation there, and then I think they've moved into a farm. So that might be a good one to contact too, because I know he's very knowledgeable about <laughs> honeybees in that area. <laughs> so yeah, and that's the group that's actually has uh, that they have the hives up at the zoo. That's the zoo is partnering Excellent. up with them. So okay. Yeah. Okay, great. That's terrific. Good. Um, oh, yeah. The group that I mentioned, Jeanette, is the, um, it's called Save Farm, S-A-V-E. Um, I think their beekeeping part is maybe, is it, um, I might be getting the name wrong, but it's a retired Colonel Gary LaGrange is his name. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any more questions for either of our speakers? Well, I'm more than happy to log off a few minutes early. I know everybody's sitting in front of a computer. We're probably all doing way too much of. Um, but this was such an inspiring and um, just fabulous presentation. And I just, yes, big round of applause for all you are both doing. Um, and we want to definitely keep us posted on how things go. Um, it's just phenomenal work and very, very excited. And we appreciate your time so very much. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you.